And you know, one of my biggest teachings up until that point was nobody has ever broken your heart, but they broke your expectations. And by breaking your expectations, they get you closer to your heart. Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Thrive State Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. V, and I am extra excited for you to listen to this week's episode with Kyle Cease. This is by far probably one of the best interviews I've heard or done ever, and I'm not joking. We talk about our stories, our awakening. We talk about consciousness and how that affects our health. We dive into stories of us being dads and how our daughters have been our best medicine. That and so much more. There was so much revelation, so much healing I got with myself in this interview, and I'm sure you will probably receive the same. Now, if you don't know who Kyle Cease is, he is a New York Times bestselling author. He has two number one Comedy Central specials and voted number one ranking on Comedy Central's Stand Up Showdown. After leaving his job as an award-winning comedian, Kyle dedicated his life to helping others and created Evolving Out Loud, which is a growing community with over 400,000 members worldwide. Kyle has made over 100 TV and movie appearances, including Jimmy Kimmel Live, The Late Late Show, and his speaking events regularly fill large venues across the U.S. He has spoken with renowned teachers such as Eckhart Tolle, Jim Carrey, Michael Beckwith, Tony Robbins, and Louis C.K. This is such a phenomenal interview. He cries, I cry. You're not going to want to miss this. So many nuggets. Ladies and gentlemen, Kyle Cease. Kyle Cease, my man. Thank you for joining the program, the Thrive State program. It is an honor to have you on the show. It is so good to see you, my friend. Yeah. So I'm going to admit to you and the audience of something, I was actually very nervous getting on the show. In fact, I, I get nervous a lot, you know, doing my TEDx talk or when I'm on national television, I still get nervous. I have this, you know, I have this dream inside of using my voice to, you know, to, and to use media and entertainment as a vehicle for health transformation, health consciousness. But every time I do something, I do something like this, I get a little bit nervous. I'm like, am I doing the right things? There's a lot of self-doubt. And then I remember this book right over here. That's so funny. I hope I screw this up. How falling in love with your fears can change the world. So tell us a little bit about that. You know, I'm living my, my dream a day at a time and I'm evolving a day at a time. But how can falling in love with your fears change the world? I feel like I'm doing that now by following this book. But why don't you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, that's a great question. So I've been doing this this work now, this transformational work. I started as a stand-up comic for 20 yeah. years, and then I had a shift where in the last 10 years, I've been really discovering in people um, a, a very common pattern, and that's that whether we're figuring out something, whether we're in our head, you know, trying to make sense out of something, whether we're ambitiously trying to achieve something, mm -hmm. almost all of these things that we're doing are our way of avoiding a specific deeper fear inside, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And the fear inside comes from an experience in the childhood. Yes. So yes. I'll give you an example. Let's say you were five and someone yelled at you and it scared you for a second. And it was so traumatic that your body goes into this crazy shock mm -hmm. and this crazy pain. And then this alternate you shows up and goes, I need to spend every waking moment making yes. sure I never feel that again. Mm -hmm. So now we're scared to feel whatever, unseen, alone, you know, these moments where we felt alone, we're scared to feel unloved. It's this core thing, unworthy, right? Not enough, yeah. yes. Not enough, right? So there, imagine that there's, or shame is a big one. Most yeah, guys yeah. I work with have a lot of shame. Mm -hmm. And imagine that's like stored in your body. And then you have this part of you that's aware that it's there, but 
every time you start to look at it, it's going to come up and leave, but you're, you've created a part of you that makes sure it's not seen anymore. Yeah. So you create alternative views that are like the bouncers that are stopping you from getting to that. I feel like I explained that a little weak, but I want to get to this because it's huge. Every person I work with, I notice when they're saying, I'm trying to make sense out of that. I'm like, don't make sense out of it. Mm -hmm. right? Just let the feeling be there. I'll go, what do you feel? And they'll say like, I feel scared, but I won't later. And I'm like, don't, don't talk about later. Just let yourself be scared. I feel humiliated. I feel shame. But I, you know, I, I think it's because X, Y, Z. And instead of focusing on what you feel, we're now focusing on the mm -hmm. reason as a deflection, right? So when I see that people feel a certain thing, usually almost every accomplishment we're even trying to achieve is the avoidance of that feeling. Yes. It's like, I want to make a million dollars because I don't want to feel what I felt when I was a child again once. And my dad said, you're nothing unless you make money. So I'll be unloved if I don't mm, make money. Yes. Right. So here's what I'm having people do is whatever they're feeling that, that they usually are scared of feeling, I have them love that feeling. Right. So, so someone could be like, I feel unworthy. And then I'll have them say to the childhood them, that's what the energy is. I believe that's mm -hmm. coming up. Yeah. You are allowed to feel unworthy in my body. You are allowed to feel alone in my body. You are allowed to feel stuck in my body. You're allowed to feel blocked in my body. The problem is not the feeling. The problem is the resistance to the feeling. Mm -hmm. The problem is the feeling that they shouldn't be feeling it and the constant judgment of that feeling, right? So when I work with people, like I always go, so what would happen? And they always say, well, I'm, I'm, I have to make this happen. I always go, well, what happens if it doesn't? This is where I open it, right? They, I have to, you know, I have to blah, blah, blah. Almost every human being has this. Right. I, have to, I have to achieve this. Well, what could happen? They go, I, I could go broke. Now, I know it's not going broke you're scared of. It's you're scared of not being loved or you're scared of not being enough or you're scared of being unworthy because you have a childhood link to that, right? Mm -hmm. So once they start to love that fear, it has no power over them, right? right? Yeah. If you really love that you could fail, if you really love that you could go broke, if you really love that you're not enough even, yes. an illusion, then it suddenly has you moving into the role of the true parent of the child that you actually have in your body. Wow. So when I work with people, I see that they have this giant fear and if they love it, then the fear has no power over them. So it starts to dissipate. So usually when I work with people, they'll have this pain in their chest or their stomach and I'll go, what do you feel about it? You know, I, I'm blah, blah, blah. And I go, okay, I love feeling unworthy. I blah, blah, blah. Then it moves from being this block to like kind of mm. moving into this much thinner, more spread around the body thing. Then I might have them allow it to be there. And basically you shift from being the avoidance of this trauma to the yeah. space that the trauma can move around in and swim mm. in and everything. And then eventually you realize you're here yes. and the trauma leaves. And so I've now worked with thousands and thousands of people and realized almost all of our ambition, almost all of our figuring out, almost all of our need to do it right is literally because you associate death to whatever that childhood experience was. Mm. And if we just allow it to be seen, you don't have to keep achieving all this stuff. You move into a higher level of oneness and ironically, you are more receptive to much bigger abundance because it's not your avoidance of this trauma, it's what you are. You are abundance. You are love. You don't need the relationship. You need your connection with yourself. And ironically, you are exactly the right match because you're safe in yourself for abundance to come to you because money isn't the answer to everything you are because a relationship isn't the answer to everything you are. So our job, in my opinion, is to expand our consciousness. And you start by understanding that you've become a collection of patterns. Yes. Society doesn't want you to know what you are because it would, it would prove to people outside of you that they might be wrong about what they're doing. And you have to start really listening to the now because the now is trying to purge your old story. And that's why when people meditate, they start freaking out. When you start listening to silence long enough, the first thing that happens is it takes your false identity 
and it wants to throw it out. It wants to purge mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Right. So you, the story of who I am is how much money I make starts to get purged or who I am is I'm loved because I achieved this or who I am as a victim. These stories start to leave. So you have no identification for a second, but then you realize you're all that is. That's a crazy first answer, but there you go. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Mic drop right there. I, I find so many parallels. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life because I think it's going to be a great segue into your next book because I resonated so much with your next book, which is The Illusion of Money, Why Chasing Money is Stopping You from Receiving It. So right. I was a boat refugee. I was born in Vietnam after, shortly after the Vietnam War. And we, my parents took me when I was only a few months old. We escaped on a re- refugee boat filled with 2,000 people. We were packed like sardines. I was on that boat for eight months. I was the only infant to survive. I had dysentery. I was like this floppy baby. My dad thought you know, he was going to lose me. I spent another three months in a Philippine refugee camp. And then we were sponsored to Los Angeles by a uh, Catholic church. And one would think, hey, a child who have gone through that experience would be so grateful, right, Kyle, to, to, to escape the jaws of death and come to America. Well, as an as, as a immigrant child growing up in America, not being white, I looked at the kids around me. Uh, I got bused to a, a, a more affluent area for schooling. So I looked at the kids around me. I looked at TV, and I just said to myself, I, I don't really feel like I belong. You know, I feel like I have a voice. I feel like I want to, you know, do entertainment or perform, but I'm looking at my heroes, whether it be a Tony Robbins or Robin Williams or Mick Jagger, none of them look like me. In fact, I, I had this feeling of not being enough, not tall enough, not rich enough, not, not white enough. And I carried that with me. My mom, you know, didn't encourage a field in entertainment. She says, Ken, you have three choices. You can be a doctor, an MD, or a physician. And so I, I, I became an MD, but I used this white coat as a mask to hide that not enoughness I had inside. So four years ago, get this, Kyle, I was overweight, diabetic, hypertensive, and I was, I was on these prescription medications. Four years ago. Four years ago. Yeah. Wow. Uh, this doctor who was giving medical advice actually had disease. And it wasn't, it wasn't until I started doing some of the personal work some plant medicine, some of the work that I, I know that you talk about. In fact, I was doing the work and as I was listening to your book, I was like, wow, this is the, it parallels my life so much because you know, that feeling of not being enough, that feeling and energy of chasing, now I've actually have the, the scientific research that shows it actually increases inflammatory states. It increases your stress hormones like cortisol, like epinephrine like in, inflammatory markers like IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. So that energy of chasing, that energy of not enough actually produced disease in my body. And it wasn't until some of that healing that I was actually able to reverse that. So did you know you were, you were writing a scientific text there when you wrote your second book? Well, it's, it's so weird because it's, you know, people sometimes will hear me talk and they go, are you doing Eckhart Tolle or are you doing Landmark or <laughs> there's, there's a scientific thing that blah, blah, blah. And I understand that. And I'm, you know, as much as I've definitely looked at things and, and things have guided me at times, I, I get all my insights from within. And then the study is my work myself. Like the study is... Yeah what it does. I've, I've experienced a, a year of bizarre synchronicities where the world literally mirrored every single thing I did. I've experienced, you know, overcoming massive darkness. I've over, I've experienced so many things. So you start to kind of notice like what, what the things are that are there. And then if I'm working with other people, I, it's weird because my rule with myself is I only am doing for a career, what will expand me, mm-hmm. right? My, my events are called mm-hmm. Evolving Out Loud. So literally every one-on-one I do, every live call, every stage thing is literally me coaching myself out loud. And the byproduct is the audience can take whatever they want with it. Mm-hmm. But I'm actually really advising myself with everything I do, right? And so most of us, you know, do work that's, they're going, I'm here to help people. Yeah. And that's great. 
but an apple tree would suck at making apples if it was totally invested in how many apples it sells, if people like apples, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. so, so my job is just to make apples and live in my highest gift and then release what people do with it, right? But I, but I have to then literally adapt what I just learned from that call or that one-on-one -on -one or that show mm -hmm. and then live it, right? And and because I believe as humans, we're always evolving and we always have the choice of evolving or contracting ourselves. And if we keep contracting ourselves, our body will actually go, I'm going to create sickness now to yes. get to to show yeah. you that you're looking backwards. And I'm going to I'm more and more while saying I'm not a doctor, believe almost all of the source of our pain inside is there's a level of awareness that we have, and then there's a level of awareness that we live. Yeah. This gap is, is suffering, right? And there's a lot of people that have accessed butterfly energy, whether it's you're an artist, whether you live in the now, whether whatever, and then they might be in a relationship that's really stagnant, mm -hmm. right? So they can't fly because they're connected to caterpillar energy, not judging, right? But like, like, the people that are living as caterpillars that are in that awareness of caterpillars, not to judge, mm -hmm. don't suffer as much as butterflies living as caterpillars, right? Mm -hmm. And I would imagine from so far of what you explained to me, your childhood was mm -hmm. like, and the experiences you, you had, that your consciousness was expanding very quickly. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But the first thing you do is go, I'm going to live at the best level I can, not as far as consciousness is concerned, but how do I just achieve greatly to make mom happy? So, okay, I'll become an MD. Right. Right. So here you have this part of your consciousness that your body has that's huge. Like you're moving towards oneness. There's a reason my work or the Eckhart of the world call to you. But then there's a you that's living within, okay, I'm an MD. That should be doing it. And there's a you that goes, this is the answer as far as one thing's concerned, but there's go you're feeling stressed because your awareness is so much bigger and you have to learn about you versus just science of medicine. Yes, exactly. Right? Exactly. You yes. have to learn about what you are and man, can you, can you bring a frequency to your work more if you live in the frequency of what you are. I hope I said that right. I feel you like you did say that right. And that's exactly what I talk about in my book, Thrive State, which is uh, coming out April 6th. It's yeah. really how the, our cells, just like us, our cells are actually receivers of the energy we provide to it. Once we start to become free, once we become a little bit more aligned to who we're meant to be, our cells basically have two main signals. They could either say, we are in thrive state, which they heal, they grow, they divide. And that's when our physical bodies have mental and peak performance. That's when we are most healthy. That's when we achieve longevity. Or they are, we are in the danger state. And when we're in the danger state, that's when inflammation goes up, immunity goes down, and that's when you get chronic disease. And so that's why I, I love what you talk about in terms of like rediscovering and remembering who we are is just love. Love is still the answer, isn't it? And well, you know what's weird is it is love is still the answer, but I'll tell you something else. I can actually find ways to tangibly, tangibly prove that we are just this moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most people think, a lot of people think they are a, a, an experience like, I'm this achiever, I'm this money, I'm a procrastinator, I'm a victim, I'm this belief system even. But these things can change and you'll still exist. So there's no way you're that, right? Like if you've yeah. believed one thing fully and then later believed another thing and don't believe that first thing anymore, right. but you've existed through both of those things, there's no way you're your belief, right? right. If you say, I'm an obese person, okay? Now you're attaching an eye to it. So if you get healthy, that's death to what you think you are. Yeah. So there's no way you will, you will be able to move if you identify as that temporary thing. 
but and you can't be your body because your body changes. Your body can get big, and and you can get you had a five year old's body and it gets tall. It can get big, little. You can add muscle. You can change it. So you're not your body because it's changeable. So what are you then? I mean, you can't be all of these. You can't be that you have ten Porsches because if that goes away you still will be here unless you think you are, then you might be suicidal or you might feel dark things because you're under the illusion that you're that thing. So what are you? If all these things can change and you can still exist, you have to only be this moment. You have to be the all encompassing space of all that is. You, you have to be the permanence that's beyond the body. You have to be the permanence that's beyond the beliefs. You have to be just now. And th- people get threatened by this. Like if you, like a millionaire might hear this and go, no, I'm, I'm that accomplishment. But what I'm saying is you're even bigger than that. Yeah, It's way cooler than that, which actually even has more potential for more abundance. But, but you're, you're just now now even includes the past and future because they don't actually exist all the past and futures are the escape of the now but you can't escape the now so you're just in our war with the now so you have to only be this now and when you accept that it can transcend your limited stories it can just take your limited stories and go okay this no longer serves you now because you're at a consciousness that is so big that uh, you know we don't need we're not grabbing on to our old limitations mm. and our our please see me mom you know our this, right. this it doesn't you now are seen by this and you're connected to this this changes everything right that's amazing infinite consciousness infinite possibilities now i want i want to dig back into your story a little bit kyle some of you who who are just meeting you for the first time might not know that you were a stand-up comic with Comedy Central specials, number one comedy specials. I believe you had two of them, done lots of movies and TV. Tell me about Kyle growing up. As the kid, I believe you started you know, stand-up at a very young age. Yes. So we want to know about where was that shift? Where was that, you know, where did Kyle go from, you know, somebody who performs comedy to like, hey, now I got this tool to really talk about transformation. So let's talk about yeah. that. Well, I started, well, I think one theory I have is that I became, I learned to become a comedian before I learned to become a person. Mm-hmm. And being a comic almost like helped pick me up over having to experience a lot of life things. Meaning I didn't have to struggle with money because I could go on stage and, and make it. I didn't have to struggle with, with feeling loved because I felt loved by hundreds of people each night. I didn't have to struggle with a lot of different things. So I didn't have to look at a lot of myself because I could just kind of keep switching the external situation and always know I have something constantly to look forward to. You know, that next gig, I had two, I did have two Comedy Central specials, all these different things. And that was really cool. And it created massive abilities in one area, but there are a lot of experiences that people got to have that weren't comics that I didn't get to have, like, like just go, having to sit in your darkness for a while, mm-hmm. you know, up until I finally like had to later. But, you know, at one point I could just always kind of skate on top of everything and have another gig and have a late night appearance. And, and, you know, I did two huge movies, 10 things I hate about you yeah. and not another teen movie and had all these little roles and different things. And one of the things that I started realizing, because as time went on, I was getting sadder and sadder. One of the things I started realizing is a huge lie that we all live in, even now, is when something happens, I'll be happy. Yeah. Right? Every human being listening to this, I guarantee you, has a little bit, when I finally get the raise, when I finally get over this addiction, when I finally get that person to like me. Yeah. Right. When I, whatever, when, when the lockdown's over, it's all in the future. Right. Mm -hmm. And I got to experience so many things that I wanted. I got to experience getting movie roles and, and, and dating people that I'd always wanted to and everything. And I wasn't happier. And at one point you start realizing if this is the source of my happiness, then it better not leave. Yeah. So you become codependent on it. 
and you have this combination of I better get more and how do I not lose this? And you start feeling like you're spinning plates, right? And you're just like, I got this movie, don't blow it. I hope I don't lose this. I hope I don't, you know, I gotta make sure I get this. So you just start to become circumstances and there's no you. And a, a huge shift of my life happened when I had to leave that by releasing control because by becoming this positive force in the comedy scene, I went through a, a, an earlier stage where I went into a Tony Robbins phase that helped me kind of have more number one specials. Mm -hmm. And then I started talking so positively in the comedy scene that I, you know, people thought I was a Scientologist or a cult leader and comics started talking crap about me. There was one morning where I said to my friend, I was, I was talking to Louis Anderson, who's a famous comedian. And I said, I, I really want to get over what people say about me. And then later that day, a, a, a angry comic wrote a blog about me. The blog went viral. He mentioned all these things about me and I must be this, you know, con artist and everything. And it went viral. And this turned out to be at first the scariest thing because I also didn't realize how much I thought who I am is what people think about me. And now I'm being attacked for being this positive guy and that I must be scamming people and all, you know, whatever. And I wasn't at all. And it went viral and comics were sharing it and saying this. So my peers were attacking me. And it was weird because this happened the morning that I said, I really want to get over what people think about me. Hmm. And, and the universe was so cool that it goes, I'm going to make you face it head on. There's so here's a gift. Hundred, here's a hundred thousand angry opinions at you. <laughs> so I stayed in a hotel for six days. And I noticed that the most I knew how to do at that point was achieve my way out of it. So for the first four days, I saw my mind coming up with, you'll have another number one special this way, and that'll prove it to them. And for four days, I kept being in the future. And then at one day I noticed on, on day four, my mind is coming up with all these solutions. Yeah. And I'm sitting in bed safe, but my mind is in fight or flight but I'm safe for four days. I've been totally safe. And my mind is like at this fight and it's, I'm like, what am I fighting? Yeah. And this was the first moment my thoughts became separate from me because I noticed my mind was doing it and I'm here fine. And it was the split that was big enough mm. where I was just totally free. My entire past, every accomplishment, every trauma was gone. And I was here with God. I would just stare at the wall mm. and I was free. And I started discovering like total freedom and yeah. joy. And it was better than the greatest accomplishment I'd ever had. And this started the shift from when something happens, I'll be happy to when I'm happy, things will happen. Yes. Okay. I want to stop you right there because I, I, you know, Eckhart Tolle had a very similar moment where, you know, he thought he was going to die and, or I can't, you know, I can't bear to live with myself and then had the realization like, Oh, who's saying myself? Yeah. Right. So I want to ask in that moment when you did discover that, were you meditating? What was going on in your experience? How did you become to realize and achieve that level of awareness? Yes, I wasn't meditating, but I also wasn't distracting myself mm, okay. by just being alone in the room for six days. Yeah, my and not turning on the TV, you know, not like trying to fix, mm. not doing gigs or getting drunk or anything, just like really just being with it. I had to hear my mind a lot, mm. right? And the longer I'm sitting there in silence, just da -da 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 -da, like the more mm. it's first, it's me. You know, and then it starts breaking off of me. And I'm like, who are you? You know, like it started being mm, this other yeah. thing. It wasn't meditating. It was just not distract. I just think that I think we're self-healing beings and mm -hmm. we're just so yes. addicted to distracting it. Mm -hmm. Like it's not hard. Dude, this year, you know, one thing I did this year was yeah. I, went to, I went to a 10 day pitch black darkness retreat. Wow. For 10 days, I sat in a dark room with no technology, a pitch black room alone that was a, just a room in the woods. I had no ability to talk to anyone. I had no ability to see anything. And I had no technology or mm. any idea of what was going on. And 
It was the most incredible experience. By day six, seven, eight, you have to go through a lot of agony the first few days because you want to mm-hmm. get out of there. Your ego is trying to go back to give me, give me, give me, yes. you know, and it finally dropped off by day six. And I started hearing silence louder than I ever had. I swear to God, dude, by day seven, I, I really felt like I could see through walls. Like I was starting to see images on the other side of the wall. And I was really so present that so much childhood trauma would just mm. pour out of me effortlessly. And, and, then I, and then on the other side of that, I swear I felt like things like, I felt like the love of my mom holding mm-hmm. me. You know, one story I had had about my mom in my body yes. was that my mom wasn't proud of me and, and didn't, you know, she loved me. But I felt like in my childhood a lot, I was proving to her that I was legit with this comedy stuff and everything. Yeah. And in the darkness retreat, all of that stuff got purged. And I, the next thing I know, I had a glimpse of my mom at a show and another one of her waving at me and proud of me. And then I just felt her arms wrap around me and she's passed away. I just felt yeah. this angel of her holding me on day seven and loving me so much. To answer your question, I don't know that mm. I definitely meditate. Yeah. But I think that we are just so self conscious human beings yeah. and we're just addicted to blocking it. And we've created yeah. patterns that need to look at Netflix all day and need to mm-hmm. go on YouTube and need to check our reputation and our our story and our Facebook. And at the same time, like if you just don't for a while, your body will heal. It's, it's magical. And, and you are supposed to be connected to source and not live every waking moment trying to avoid it and going, when I get the relationship, I'm enough. Yeah. When I have enough money, I'm enough. When I, this is not how we were designed as human beings to live. It's more like when I have hard times, I go, all I need to do is get away and not bring my phone where I won't distract myself from source. That's so, beautiful. Were you guided here or did you read up on it to, to know this is how it's going to go for the next seven days? How did you go about creating this experience for yourself? In the, in the darkness retreat? Yeah. Uh-huh. So, so there is a place that does it in Ashland, Oregon, mm. and you can pick as many days as you want. And I have decided I'm going 10 days. And I really, I, I'm staying there. There's a double door so that they can give you food. They bring you food twice a day. And, you know, there's a, it's dark on one side and they put the food in and then you can open it on this side. Wow. Right? Uh huh. And so you'll never see light for 10 mm-hmm. days. Right. And there's no guidance or someone talking or anything. It was just literally, he, he takes me into the room. He goes, all right, so this is the bed. This is the, you know, bathtub. I lived in the tub for 10 hours a day, probably. And he goes, and this <laughs> is, uh, here's a mat. If you want to do some yoga, here's the sink, here's the toilet. And then he takes a light bulb out and undoes it, mm-hmm. closes the door and said, I'll be here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. with food. And I swear from the first night to the morning, I thought three weeks had gone by. I was like, you, this is that was it like that was really just yeah. over you know because time you realize actually how much time you have hmm. if you're not in the head wondering how thinking right. of it is short right now you and, meditate a lot and you you know so so you're an experienced meditator going into this, this experience did you still feel at all any any kind of withdrawal from the regular world you know in, in, in your first couple like of days that. Oh, yeah. yeah. What would happen was I would feel something and then I would feel that pattern break off like this. Mm. So like, like day five, I would feel a thought that goes, I really want to go home right now. And I, and I could go home. And then another voice overrides it and goes, tell me why you want to go home. It's almost like a pattern said, mm. I want to go home. Yeah, and then yeah. a God version of me shows up and holds space for that one. It goes, mm. tell me why you want to go home. And he goes, I just, you know, I miss my daughter. I miss, you know, my, my friends. I want to blah, blah, blah. And I, and I, it's almost like a two me's were there. One that was complaining and, and in its pattern. And the other one that was like the 
the safe God dad for it. Mm-hmm. And it would, I would sit there, I would, da, 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 and then I would cry. And then that child one would dissolve and there'd be a me here and it's even louder. Mm. Like the silence is even louder. The God right. is even louder, right? So that was how, what would happen. It would be like a me that shows up and it would be annoyed. It would be mad at someone and feel off. And then that would break off. And then another me goes, I don't want to do this. And then that would break off. And then another me is like, there, this is me. And they goes, no, I don't know how to, and then that would break off. And one of the analogies that I came up with that I think was one of my biggest revelations of all mm-hmm. is when you get a suntan, you're either in the sun or not, right? <laughs> and as long as you're in the sun, you're getting tan, right? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter what you're thinking about or if you're trying to orchestrate your tan, you're getting tanner, right? Yeah. This analogy was what I felt like I'm in the conscious version of the sun. I'm in a 10 day sun tanning. And no matter how much my mind tries to kick in and explain myself or whatever, I'm, I'm in here and I just need to let time do its thing Mm. and tan me (laughs) consciously and notice as my patterns are kicking around and, trying to negotiate this or whatever and get back in the shade. My patterns are trying to get into the shade, but I'm here to get tan. So as much as they struggle to get in the shade, right, I'm going to become tanner. <laughs> mm. Does this make sense? This to- totally makes sense. And now, now I, I completely understand why these, you know, I have a lot of friends that have gone through 10 day silent retreats. Mm-hmm. Just to be alone with your thoughts and realize, hey, those thoughts are just old patterns that you just picked up, you know, as a bystander growing up in our society yeah. that you don't have to attach yourself to. And that period of time where you know you're safe allows the larger consciousness to be able to say, you are safe, you are love, and you are not these thoughts that were, were running your life before. Yes. So, yeah, it completely makes sense. Well, you, know, you want to know something really weird too. Huh was all the egoic reasons that you come up with to leave there. Like I got to run my business. I got to, yeah. they took care of themselves so much more. Like in the 10 days I was gone, mm-hmm. we sold more stuff. Our business was thriving more than I've ever seen mm. while I was doing nothing. Amazing. And it was almost as if it goes, yeah, that egoic part of you that's trying to run everything. It's actually in the way of real success. I, I need you to experience that I got it. Meaning the universe is like, mm. I got it. That like, is amazing. You, you need to like, I, like I always see, in fact, there's a video I'm about to release about, you can hire the universe. Like, <laughs> you know, like, like we're always trying to figure out what, what do I do about this? And real, remember there's something that made the Pacific ocean and Pluto that, that probably knows how to handle your emotions. Mm-hmm that probably knows how to handle what they're going to say about you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So you don't have to egoically take care of those things. And the more you merge with that source, the more you realize you're the source of abundance, the more you realize you're the source of love and, and you're not needing money to fulfill you yet. You're also a safe place for it to come to. Yes. Right. Or anything. Yeah. I, I love that, that energy. This brings me to a question that I have because you talk about how changing your story has such a profound effect on on your life. And I actually know that if you change your story, you actually change the way you feel about things and that's going to change your biochemistry in your body. I'm a doctor. So, you know, the story actually is medicine. So how do you, how do you walk through somebody that might have a disempowering story or a belief and get them to shift that? Because You know, I love people to know this part because I tell people that if you change your story, you could seriously change not only your life, but your health and and how you approach the world. So what what are some practical things that people can do? Well, what if there's an even more where it's instead of changing your story, understand there's no story. Check this out. Because you're only now, right? I think Rupert Spira said this, but you can't. You and I can't go visit our past. We can think about it, but we'll still be in the now, right? Mm -hmm. We can't go visit our future. Like you can't go see you a week ago. You can't go hang out with you, right? You can't go into your future. Mm -hmm. Literally, the only Mm -hmm. thing we are is now, right? Mm -hmm. So, So I find even a positive story is limited. Ah, I see what you mean, yes. 
I mean, am I the guy who did those movies or am I the now? Am I the guy who's accomplished all those things or am I the now? And the more I'm the now, the more I'm not confined to a past thing, even if the past thing is the greatest thing, I'm still saying I'm that. So moving beyond that would be death to me, right? If I get that I'm infinite possibility, I'm infinite consciousness, I'm all that is, you're Mm -hmm. all that is, everyone watching, you are all that is. If you meditate long enough, you'll have proof of it, right? Yeah then you are a a person that can, I don't even want to say that can change things or create things. Mm -hmm. You're just on a different frequency. And the more Mm -hmm. I do this work, I'll say something that's going to just sound crazy to a lot of people. So forgive me. And I, my offer is be open to it. The more I do this work, the more I'm starting to think that the world is literally mirroring your consciousness. This episode of the Thrive State Podcast is brought to you by Thrive State MD Immunity Supplement. I actually developed this supplement at the start of the coronavirus pandemic. As some of you may know, I'm a frontline healthcare worker and have worked directly with COVID-19 patients. Some of you may also know that during that time, my fiance was pregnant with my daughter. I had a bonus daughter at home, and I also had elderly parents I needed to protect. I wanted to serve my patients at the highest level while making sure that the people around me were safe. And I couldn't find a product that was out there that actually had quality ingredients at meaningful dosages that would keep my immune system operating at its optimal form. I ended up having to buy supplements from multiple different sources to get the right quality, the right quantity, and the right formulation of an immune product I know would keep me safe. And while I never got sick using that formulation, it costed me hundreds and hundreds of dollars. The Thrive State Immunity Formula is a premium immune formula designed to enhance the body's own natural immune defenses. It is a unique blend of well-researched vitamins, minerals, and medicinal mushrooms, including vitamin C and D3, zinc, quercetin, astragalus, cordyceps, reishi, turkey tail, and beta-glucan. Kaya is now born. She's two months old as of the time of this recording. I'm still continuing to serve by treating COVID-19 patients. And I feel really confident about my immune system, applying the techniques outlined in my book, Thrive State, and taking the Thrive State MD immunity supplement. If you haven't already, pick up my book at thrivestatebook.com. And if you would like an immunity supplement of your own, The listeners of the Thrive State podcast get 20% off by using the code THRIVE20. Remember, you are your best medicine. Now let's get back to the episode. So imagine this. Have you ever had it where you really, really want something? You really want something. You really want something. Finally, you don't want it anymore, and it shows up. All the time, yeah. All the time. I think that you we want something because we're hitting trauma if we don't have it i need a relationship because i'm scared to be alone Mm -hmm. right but if you can connect to the a part of you that has a trauma about being alone because you associate alone to a bad memory in your childhood transcend that trauma and it's not there it's almost as if the world imagine if you if, if the world is like a dream when you're asleep and you're dreaming the real truth of everything you're seeing is there an image you're projecting in your mind. Every yes. character in the dream you're creating. So is the goal to get the greatest woman in the dream? Is the goal to make as much money in the dream? Or is the goal to realize you're dreaming and wake up? The more I do this work, the more I really believe it's mirroring me wow and and that yours is mirroring you and that we're in this thing that's because the amount of times man that i start to understand if i really move in the embodiment of this all that isness and then just get synchronicity after like every every, there's been times where i was so it wasn't even exciting it was normal that It would just, the thing of the person there, there every second, you're always taken care of. Your mind is so aware. Mm. And I would have people who would hang with me for a day and go, what the hell is going on? Like you said that and that guy's there. And I have so many weird, like not like, oh, that's a coincidence. It's too specific and too weird. Like thousands of things like that. 
that I think the world is mirroring me. And I think your world is mirroring you. So when a person goes, oh God, you know, life is so hard, you know, it's so hard to make money or it's so hard to find abundance. I really believe there's something we're storing in our body that's trauma that you're still living from a childhood pattern, whether you had parents that said it's not easy to make money, whether you, you know, that whether you saw your parents get divorced over money and now you're scared that you'll get divorced if you have money, you get what I'm saying? Like whatever that thing is you're, you're hiding from and that thing is still running the show. And the reason it's got negative things coming to you is to break you from your fear of it, right? Like, like if you're scared to be shamed, then the greatest thing that could happen to you is everyone shames you. So you can see you're still safe even after it. If you're scared to be unloved, the greatest thing is for that person to leave you. So you can see you're still loved after it. Right. Yeah. So, so this is why I believe we manifest negative things into our life. Right. Like be, it's not, and don't hear that as guilt or shame Hear that as exciting. That's empowering. Yeah. Right because you can get aware of what's in you. And when I work with people, I see a pattern that's in them and, and they're a desire for something is because of their negative pattern that's yeah. scared to have the opposite. Mm-hmm. And if we heal that, then you don't need the thing and you're safe for it to come into your life. Yeah. Would you say that for most people you work with, are they able to, you know, once they get into the now, would you say that that healing is pretty instantaneous? Well, yes, definitely, definitely. Well, I mean, one of the factors is people that work with me are aware they're going to work with me and know that they're going to be vulnerable because we're going to open this up and see what's there. But I have a ton of YouTube videos, 500, and some are me shifting people. Like there's a guy that we just released a ton of trauma with on YouTube. And you can see it's called, the video is Kyle Cease, Every Man Needs to See This. And mm. it's a guy who uh, I was working with, his name's Michael. And he was telling me, like his, his video started that he's scared. Uh, he, for some reason, he's scared of getting these illnesses. He doesn't have diabetes, but right. he's scared to get it. And he's also scared that he won't be able to afford the medicine for it. It's a really interesting thing, right? Because yeah. he doesn't have it. But he has this pattern of fear of it. And then a pattern of, I won't be able to afford the medicine for yeah. it. And he, when he was telling me it, he told me like six layers. I won't afford the medicine and then I'll be broke and then I won't be able to have kids. And, and I was like, well, first of all, I see that you're taking on too much. Let's do one at a time, mm-hmm. right? The universe just takes on one thing at a time. So I'm scared I'll have diabetes. And then we just looked under it and we realized that his constant looking into the future about mm-hmm. what could go wrong came from the fact that one day he was at a water slide park. There was a woman he was really attracted to. He had his shirt off and she judged him. He felt mm. so humiliated that he created a character yep. that does everything it can to avoid that pain again. Yeah. So now it's, it's looking ahead every second of the worst case scenario and trying to pre-fix it, even though there's no problem there. Uh, yeah. That became his identity since that water slide park. So you get to watch me work with him, undo the first fear, and we keep going lower. And finally, I got to the place where he was humiliated in that water slide park. So you know what I had him say to the pattern? You're allowed to feel humiliated. Mm -hmm. He goes, you're allowed to feel humiliated. And he told the energy. And then you just watch him cry for like five minutes of Mm. just huge release. And you start to realize that pattern that I just watched him cry. He could have filled, he could have filled this up with his tears, yeah. right? That pattern was living on the surface, yeah. trying to come out. And he created an alternative identity on top of it, right? Mm. And if we get that identity out of the way and I can see the thing, right? Like there's this release that's so huge. And then it goes, there's another thing under it. We started finding another incident before that of trauma and self-judgment. And he cried that out, right? And it was this, it's this crazy one hour of him releasing thing after thing after thing. Dr. Kyle Cease, the (laughs) spiritual surgeon. All I know is that your body, your body wants to go to the bathroom every day. 
right? And mm -hmm. your body emotionally does too. Mm -hmm. and crying should be totally normal. Yeah. We have tear ducts for a reason. But there's a way that humans have created, it's bad to cry. They've tried yeah. to figure out what's wrong instead of just letting themselves cry. And that would be like, instead of going to the bathroom when you have to go to the bathroom, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what it is you're about to crap, <laughs> right? <laughs> Trying to figure out where it comes from. Is it from a past life that I have to go poop? Is it like you'd, that'd be, you'd never go to the bathroom and you just have all these alternative things to stop you from, from doing it, right? And my job is to be like, just crap, right? And not to be gross, but your job is to just let your body release, right? Are you so putting a mark there like I can't? Yeah, remember? yeah. Well, I'm putting a mark here because I also want on our team to go back in this section to, to create the show notes. Can you let the people know what the name of that YouTube video is again? That, that video is called Every Man Must See This or Every Man Needs to See This. And the, the thumbnail says releasing shame, anger, guilt, trauma. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of videos of me working with people like that. One is called um, The the real cause of loneliness hmm. uh, where I'm working with a woman who is, is, you know, she's trying to figure out how to stop feeling alone. And she says, so I'm trying to find more friends. And I said, yeah, but then you'd be more alone because your loneliness has nothing to do with how many people are around you. And we start going to what really causes her, her loneliness. And I believe it's your judgment of the moment. That's it. So we yeah. started to go with that and she cries that out. So what I think, at least now, one of my roles is here is to undo my trap stuff. Yeah. I'm in a frequency where I can see others, right? Because a gift. I've undone mine and I'm feeling this connection to source. So your vibration rises yeah. and you hold a space of higher vibration that just holds safety and love for people that are in a vibration that's scared to release itself. And our job is to connect more to a higher now that will purge that story that no longer serves you. Wow, amazing. What an amazing gift. And thank you for what you do, Kyle. I do want to get to this question because I found immense healing. And I just wanted to, to get your take on this. And this was actually right around the story of, of the birth of my, my daughter. You know, we were, my, my partner, Tiffany, she is a little bit on the older side. She is 38. And we were told by her OB that, you know, it's probably not good to have the baby in utero longer than 39 weeks, the risk of complications. So we decided to induce. My, so, was to see, you know, my daughter's mom was 46. Oh, wow. Okay. She yeah, had amazing. 47, actually. So amazing. just, we have that in common, but keep going. Sorry. I just yeah. So we enter the hospital. We, we get induced. A couple minutes later that evening, the nurses started to run in. They said, we, we couldn't find your, your baby's heartbeat. And we weren't prepared for this. We wanted a vaginal birth. Pretty soon, one nurse turns into two nurses, turns into three. And then we have the entire floor now in our room. And the OB that, that steps in says, we need to take her to a C-section right now because we can't find the baby's heartbeat. Baby needs to come out now. And uh, we, rush, we rush into the operating room. I remember hearing a cry, the doctor uh, raising baby Kaya above the, the surgical sheets. And we see her and they, they wheel her off to the corner where the neonatologists are. And daddy comes in, I get to cut the cord and pretty soon she starts turning blue. And then I see her oxygen saturation is just decreasing. We'll then see her not move very much. And then the doctors are like, we, we have to take her to, to the ICU now. And here I am, a new dad run, running in. And I remember all these thoughts you know, did we do the right thing in terms of like wanting to get induced? Did, did that cause this complication? Is this the right hospital that we entered? I remember thoughts of like judging the, the doctors that were involved. And then I was starting to think, man, she, if she lost, if she lost circulation coming out, it turns out that, that, that actually the cord was wrapped around her neck and, and she was kicking on her cord. So she wasn't getting any circulation. Then I was fearing, what if, what if she lost some kind of cognitive ability or some kind of you know health function because she didn't get this oxygen and when i finally held her in my arms for the first time she's got tubes down her nose in, into her mouth and ivy coming out of her arms and i was just 
looking at her and I said, you know what? It does not matter, you know, what capacity she is. She is what she is right now. And I'm just looking at her with everything going on. And I said, I love her, all of her. And all of this, it doesn't matter what, you know, what happens. I just love her. And then I just thought of myself and I, and I look back growing up as a child and I said, why did I need all these additional things to feel like I'm loved, like I'm worthy? Because Kaya doesn't need this. I love her no matter what. And it was such a healing experience for me. And I wonder what your experience was like, you know, having, having a child and a daughter for the very first time. Well, first of all, that's beautiful. And I love my daughter so much that I know what you felt and made me want to cry almost because I am, I'll tell you, your daughter's now how old? One month? Yeah, just a little over a month old. What's crazy for me is how much it's growing. I, I, I feel like for me, having a daughter was so exciting at the beginning and just is growing into being this insane part of my heart and the most important thing ever. I mean, just this morning, she walked into the room and said, dad, I can at 4am. And I'm just excited to be woken up by her. I see this little silly, you know, she's almost she's three and a half now. And I just see this little dark silhouette with this little kind of, you know, gut and that kind of arched back, you know, Dada, can you can you snuggle with me and hold my hand and I get out and go over to her room and, and do that. And it's like, more it's so much better than any giant thing i've ever accomplished right yeah right you know if, like, when i'm looking back at 100 years old that moment will be when i got a new york times bestseller you know mm -hmm. and that by the way i realize this i wasn't saying that to throw in that it's a new york times <laughs> <laughs> really by the way <laughs> yeah well i know how people do that you know what i mean like, and it doesn't matter that I've spoken at 90 different countries. And that I've, <laughs> that's not what I'm, I really sincerely meant that. One aspect that of my, my life is that I was very close with my mom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For the 20 years before I had my daughter, no matter what I accomplished, my mom wanted to be a grandma. My mom is so great with kids and that was her big dream. And this, this is a crazy story that'll, that'll take a turn probably, uh, but it'll, it'll shock you and it'll give you kind of what I learned about this. So for 20 years, it didn't matter who I dated. My mom wanted to be a grandma. She was like, when are we yeah. going to have kids? You know, it was her thing. First of all, Vivi's mom and I found out we were pregnant the same moment Trump won. <laughs> <laughs> So November 8, 2016, you know, they're <laughs> announcing literally on the news, you know, and Trump takes this one and this one. And her mom, Christy, goes, I wonder if they're saying this for ratings or something and they're going to switch it to Hillary. And then she said, my, my thing says pregnant. And I said, I wonder if it's saying that for ratings and it's going to switch to not pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and we found out we're pregnant. I told my mom and she was just shocked and she was so excited. And for eight months, um, my mom was really excited. And we also went through, there might be something wrong with the baby. Yeah. And that brought fear into me and, and massive uncertainty. And that was wrong. Thank God. And my mom was scared too. At one point we got a, a sonogram and they said, the baby's fine. <laughs> Sorry. And I, like, my mom is someone who worried a lot. Yeah. yeah. And when, when they said the baby is fine, my mom had this switch where she said, um, well, then it's fine then. And I've never heard her, like, she'd be like, are you sure? Usually like, you know, yeah. but here's the craziest part hmm. is my mom also somehow or around this time randomly got dementia and went insane in the hospital and lost her cognitive functions. And six weeks before Vivi was born, she died. Mm -hmm. <sighs> and um, what I learned from it 
was when my mom died, I had to surrender that plan mm. that they, they were going to be together. And you know, one of my biggest teachings up until that point was nobody has ever broken your heart, but they broke your expectations. And by breaking your expectations, they get you closer to your heart. And my mom broke my expectations by dying. But weirdly, ironically, because she died, I cried out the part of me that always seeked her approval. Yeah. I cried out the me that wanted her to see me. Mm -hmm. And what this caused was me to be become more present. What this caused was me to become more here. And instead of me being a dad that goes, mom, look at what my daughter did. Mom, do you see this? Yeah. I became more of what I truly am here to be more of a direct father for my daughter. Yeah. I think, you know, everything that feels like loss or dark yeah. has this other side to it. Yeah. Like I believe as we're all in a lockdown and we can't go to our restaurants and we can't function or have our business the way we want, we're also awakening. Yes. Ram Das says basically struggle is really struggle is really the sandpaper for our awakening. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if, when I look at the lockdown from the government perspective, I don't know what's going on, but when I look at it from God's perspective, mm -hmm. yeah, this is all of us like healing and releasing and learning our patterns. I feel like God is shining a collective flashlight down all yes. of us, mm -hmm. our patterns and helping us purge our past and get more and more and more present. Yeah. Yeah. And, and get more and more grateful for now and stop anticipating because I kind of think that up until 2020, many of us had our life comfortable enough that we didn't, but not thriving or what we truly are. Just I have an, enough of a job or I have an, enough of a relationship to not have to look at myself. And God's like, let's wipe all of that out. And, and our patterns are just being cried out constantly. You know, I guess, yeah, with my daughter, my mom leaving would be, if you told me that three years ago or, or five years ago, yeah. You know, I'd be so horrified, but I had to really say goodbye, not only to my mom, but to the me yeah. that, that was around my mom, the kid me that said, mm. mom, do you see me all the time? And what was on the other side is always a work in progress, but yeah. I, I, mean, I cried because there's still some there, right? Yeah, yeah. But is, is, a, is a more me and, and life is doing its thing for all of us in 2020 to really make sure in 2021, we, we really get to know why we were on this planet. We get yeah. to learn who we truly are. That, so now I can just tell you that moments with my daughter, it, you know, had 2020 not been full of lockdowns and COVID, Good. I could, I might still be on tour yeah. and yeah. missing her a lot more. You know, I might be, I might be doing, I'd be teaching meditation somewhere at a retreat maybe, but I'd be gone for a whole week and, and yeah. not be with her as much. And this is the first year of my life, 2020 is that I didn't travel almost, I, I flew one time to one time and back, you know, and I'm now working at my house yeah. and I see her all the time and I get to work. And last night, she held my hand and went to sleep in five minutes. And she asked me two questions. Daddy, why do you have clients? Which is an amazing question for it. <laughs> and do I come from life? I don't even know what that means, but it made me cry, you know, <laughs> and just like this experience of her, she is so beautiful. Yeah. She is so caring and she is so loving. I don't know that I would have known that 
had my mom not died and had COVID not slowed me down yeah. and other aspects of 2020 that made me have to really look at myself and change, you know, and grow these, I might've missed this yeah. and like, yeah, look at my success. Cause I'm on a bigger stage, but I don't give a sh I don't, I don't know what, how much you yeah. want me to wear, but I think <laughs> you have an idea of what was coming. Yeah. I don't care. I don't, I really don't care about numbers. I don't care about success. I don't care about success is the now success yeah. me with this girl. I don't care how big my connections are as far as how famous I am or what people think about me. It's just now, That's dude, so I'll, show you, I'll show you, um, this is, this is me now. I'm such a dad. It's crazy. <laughs> see her she sings and she's musical and she i know i sent you a video of her singing watch this one this one is one of my favorites okay look at this oh my goodness This is all the time. Oh my God. They are, they're certainly, she's been my medicine and there, there, there's so much evolution that I, you know, I have, and you know, I know we're short on time, so I'd love to maybe even chat about parenting and, and how somebody who is evolving can be the best parent to somebody who's a blank slate at this point. But I know we're running a short on time. So I'll finish with, with two questions. I can, I can go a little longer. There's a, there's another you thing. Can? I'm, I can't just bounce into another thing. Like, <laughs> like from this well, that, that, okay, great. I'm going to ask that other question then because we are an evolving version of ourselves day to day. And, you know, as we awaken, we, we recognize there is maybe an opportunity to potentially protect our children from not, you know, experiencing some of those traumas as well. In the past, I don't know. What, what, are your, what are your thoughts there? How to, how to best parent in, in, in a situation like that? Well, I say this with only three years of experience, but yeah. I'll say that the more I heal my inner child mm -hmm. inside of me, the more I'm safer, the more expansive I am, and the more expansive she is. Yeah. If I'm in a state of constantly trying to make sure she avoids things, I mean, I'm not talking about yeah. let her run in the street. I don't mean that. Right. But like, I think that what we've experienced as trauma, if we don't heal it, we then go into this kind of ex external, like, don't do, I don't want you to, I don't want you to feel the thing that I'm scared to feel. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so now I, I'm not here trying to parent from a place of what could go wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm here expanding myself and finding my own inner compass and then you, letting her know she has her own inner compass. I mean, there's a level where I don't say, you, you know, eat anything you want. Right. But I also, I also and, and her mom is also good at this, eat when you tell us you're hungry versus us say at 6 p.m. eat, right? Like yeah. we actually care about your compass and your guidance system and you communicating and learning to, like, isn't that a weird moment where even though we all do it, like we say when you eat, I don't care if you're hungry, I don't care what your stomach says, well, 6 p.m. is the time or whatever. It's a weird, just that is such a subtle authority outside of me knows better than my stomach. And that's what causes people to go to restaurants and when, when the person asks someone across from you what they want to eat, they look at you and go, do I want pancakes or waffles? It's like, you think I know better than you what you want to eat? Mm -hmm. Like we're so disconnected from our own guidance system, yeah. right? Yeah. So one thing I notice is the more I transcend my own trauma, ironically, the more safe I am. But if you're more like, like you, I think you probably know, if you're spending every moment driving, scared of getting into a car accident and driving to prevent it, you're yeah, gonna yeah. aim for it, Yeah. right? The people that have that get into more than the people who aren't even thinking of that, right? Yeah. So I'm here to transcend myself and bring that more higher frequency version of me to my daughter. 
and I and and I notice that she's just happier. She dis, she she chooses really good higher creative things. She becomes so much more empathetic to others. She herself like has her own doll that she likes to parent to and she'll she'll like walk around and push a cart as a mom to a, a doll and I watch her just so be compassionate and come on and gently put the doll here and you know she's she's absolutely I believe the best thing I could say as a parent is you have to follow your heart always yeah. mm. because what you're doing is you're teaching your kids how to live based on how you're living. Yeah. So, so there's people like, I'd love to live in my highest, but I have a kid. Well, then you're teaching your kid don't live in your highest and blame their kids in the future. Ooh. Right. Yeah. So, so your kid is actually your reason, not your reason. You can't, it's your reason you have to. Oh, Wow. We're going to end right there. Before we go though, Kyle, how do people work one-on-one -on -one with you? I know you've got an all access pass. How do people find you? I, my, I get excited about this because it's so cool, but my favorite thing is to go, how much content can I deliver for how cheap, right? How, how, how much can we deliver? So we have a thing called the absolutely everything pass. And let mm -hmm. me tell you what it is. It is, the, it is the greatest way to create a service for so many more people, which is great for anyone coming because it also makes them a huge community of people. There's yeah. thousands of members in the Absolutely Everything Pass. And what it is, is it's $29 a month and you can cancel anytime. So for $29, come on. And there's, first of all, 200 hours of past content there, meaning huge events online events, business, you know, there's a thing called the entrepreneurial shift. There's a thing called the limitation game interactive, which is one of my live events along with me breaking in and giving you at home exercises to do. But also there is almost every day of the week, a different event that I host or I have another person host live. So on Sundays, every Sunday at 11 a.m. Pacific time, Anyone from around the world can tune in and I do a one hour talk, including meditation on oneness, right? Mm -hmm. On Monday night, we do a thing called It's Totally Possible, where people can come on and watch as, as people literally sit there and list things that are totally possible in a positive way. Now, what worrying is, is saying what's totally possible in a negative way. Yeah. Right? So if you're sitting here going, if I was to sit with you for 10 minutes and just go, it's totally possible 2021 is the greatest year of our entire lives. It's totally possible that I expand my body and do a whole new way of healing. It's totally possible I experience freedom in a way I hadn't experienced. It's totally possible my bond with my daughter and I experience. You keep doing this and you start to, to access this creative zone in your body that puts you in this constant state. And I get more excited about the painter than the painting. So it's what you become in doing this. So on Monday nights, people come on and live do it and you can do it live on a thing and check this out. We're taking that and we're making an online streaming thing where you can just watch 24 hour loops of people listing. It's totally possible to create an overall higher vibration on the planet. Tuesday night, there's a workshop of It's Totally Possible. And Wednesday night, we do a live Q&A with me and I take people on the call and I shift them in front of people. Thursday morning, one of my teammates, Joey, hosts a breathwork class and it goes all week. So you have a, a wow. lot of online class. And it's $29 a month. You can cancel. It's less than a dollar a day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you could literally fill yourself all day with content live events and all of our past talks are archived so there's also another you know few hundred hours from that so it's really like 500 i don't know it's like 500 hours of content oh amazing stuff for business stuff whatever it's so cool because so many people are there and they have created their own community and support each other and they zoom each other and you get to meet these high conscious people there are so many couples that have formed from this mm. babies that have been born from that you know like it's all of that so <laughs> So, so what's, what's, what's the website for them to access that? KyleCease.com. It, it's the everything pass. I think it's KyleCease.com slash everything. I don't know. I, <laughs> I'm so bad at marketing because I'm just in the moment. But, yeah. We'll but, look it up and we'll put it in our, in our show notes. And yeah. question for you, 
for you, and I'm really looking forward to this answer, is with everything you've gone through, what has been your best medicine? My daughter, honestly. Yeah. It's, it's a tie between my daughter and the now, because the <laughs> now created my daughter, but the, my daughter puts me more in the now. So I kind of, it's like a chicken or the egg here. <laughs> But that's that's it. It's just now. It's the feeling of the beating of my heart and and understanding that success to feel that I'm here. And the more you understand success is measured by are you okay with the now, the more you create a major space, ironically, for abundance to come to you. And you kind of don't care because your happiness is here. That is amazing. Kyle Sees, thank you for your time, brother. It was so good connecting. A lot of, lot of juicy take-home items. So many mics dropped. I didn't know there were so many mics in the sky. But uh, thank you for your time today, brother. It's so good to see you, brother. So much love. And, and you guys will have to come visit and, and bring everyone over. L looking forward to it. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you're finding this podcast to be valuable, if you're learning a lot, Please share with your friends and family members, and please consider leaving a five-star review at ratethispodcast.com slash thrivestate. That review is really going to help the show grow. And if you haven't already, pick up a copy of my book, Thrive State, at thrivestatebook.com. I would love to connect with you on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and LinkedIn at KianVuMD. Remember, you are your best medicine.